I am good. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to my talk, Do You Still Need SAS in 2023? Um, this, hopefully everyone enjoys this talk. I've enjoyed writing it and learning about where SAS and CSS is right now. So yeah, let's dive in. Uh, I'm going to see, I think I skipped a sl slide. So a little bit more about me. Uh, my name is Aubrey Sambor. I am a lead engineer at Lullabot. We are a, remote, a fully remote company that has been around since about 2006. We do a lot of work on like higher ed, higher ed sites, government sites, other like um, private sector companies, things like that. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, I live in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is about an hour and a half west of Boston for anyone who might know the area. Um, it's a pretty cool area. Um, and I've been writing CSS since about 1998. Um, I started, and this is something I would not do today, but I wanted to remove the links from my underlines, and the only way to do that in 1998 was to learn CSS to do the text decoration none underneath your links. Would not advise doing that now because it's not accessible, and you want to be able to show your users that there's an underline there. So, yeah, don't do that. But for me, that was my like, that was how I got my dip my toes into CSS, and I haven't looked back since. Uh, to find me online, I am no longer on what was formerly known as Twitter. I am on Mastodon as starshaped at labyrinth.social. Um, I have a blog at starshaped.org. I don't really write a lot of tech stuff. I've been writing a lot more about albums I, li albums I didn't listen to in the early 2000s and giving them reviews. So if you're into like music content, feel free to read my blog. And of course, I am on drupal.org, also as starshaped. I'm on Starshaped at GitHub as well. I don't really have a lot of stuff on my GitHub because I keep everything private, but I am pretty much Starshaped everywhere if you want to find me. So, what are we going to talk about here today? Uh, firstly, I'm going to give an overview of native CSS features that can replace existing SAS functionality in case you want to go ahead and try to you know, replace some of your SAS with CSS. I'm going to also talk about using post CSS to implement up and coming CSS features that may not be supported in every single browser or things that you might want to try out before it becomes the spec. Um, I'm, going to add, I'm going to talk about ways to uh, add some native CSS to your SAS code so you can start using modern CSS while using SAS at the same time. And then answer the question at the end, should you use SAS, should you still use SAS in 2023? So, what can SAS right now do in 2023? First of all, um, custom properties. They've been around for a long time, since about 2016, and instead of, instead of using SAS variables, you can use these CSS custom properties instead. They're also called CSS variables. I'm not sure why they're just not called CSS variables, because custom properties sounds a lot more confusing, but I'll probably use both interchangeably, but that's what I mean when I say custom properties, just CSS variables. And if you haven't seen what they look like, I have a couple examples, and I think they're big enough. If they're too small, I can try to bump the size up a little bit just to make sure you can see them. But it's to, you define them in your root, at root or anywhere else, but in general, you would define them as root in your root with the dash dash my awesome CSS variable. And then to use them within your code, you just do a var with the dot dash dash my awesome variable. I'll have some examples. There is going to be some code in this. I'm not going to do any, not a lot of live coding. Hopefully the internet is great so that, I, that things still work. But yeah, I'll be showing off some things here that CSS and SAS can do. Um, a, good a good reason to use custom properties is that they're not compiled like they're not compiled like SAS is. You can actually update CSS variables on the fly so that you don't have to wait for your compilation time and like build, like uh, push a new, push your code up to the repository and get deploy it to get your changes to show up. You can just change them automatically on the fly without any kind of extra work or anything like that. One downside about CSS custom properties for now, I don't know if the spec will ever change, you cannot use a custom property as a media query. And we'll talk about an option on how to kind of mimic this later on. I have more slides about that. But custom properties out of the box like this, yeah, you can't use them in your media queries, which is 
kind of a bummer. And then I've got a code pen down here that demonstrates how you can change a CSS variable um, value on the fly. So let me fire up this code pen here. It's this one right here. Let me make sure you can actually see it. Um, so I've got a bunch of code at the top, um, just, the HT just the HTML that's building out this box here with the um, teal background color. And there's a button on the top that says change color. So it's going to change the color of the background from teal to like a pink. But that's what the HTML is doing. The CSS is doing the same kind of thing where it's defining the, custom, the CSS variables for the text color and the background color, which right now is teal. And I've got some other stuff in here that's just defining this box. And over here, I can write JavaScript. I am not. Uh, I'm more of a front of the front end CSS, HTML, accessibility front end developer. I can write JavaScript. I know there is a better way to write this JavaScript, but this is how I did it for this demo and it works. So I can go and refactor this uh, at some point to make it better. But to explain what this is doing, um, I'm using a couple variables to get some of the custom properties here. Um, this page styles right here is using getting the document document element. So it's getting everything on the page that's in there, all the attributes of the document, including the CSS variables. So I wanted to do that so I can do the next thing down here, which inside this function, which runs when you click on this button over here, um, it'll get the property value of that background color custom property I set, which again is currently set to teal. But when you click on it, what I'm doing, if the background is teal, I'm using something called document element dot style dot set property, and I'm changing that background color custom property to pink instead of teal. So now when you click on this, it'll change it to teal on the fly. Um, again, there's probably a better way to do this within JavaScript. Probably want to add, like, add and remove a class to the, the, um, to the div or something like that. But this was mainly just to, to demonstrate that you can actually change the background color um, custom property from pink to teal on the fly without having to like compile your code or anything like that. So yeah, it's pretty nifty. I like that, you're, that we're able to do this. I want to look into writing this code better so that I have my JavaScript a little bit better, but it could be worse. It works. That's all that matters. So next up, after custom properties is math in native CSS. Um, of course, I'm gonna bring up calc because calc has been around for a really, really long time. I feel like it's been pretty underutilized a lot. Um, like I feel like I've only really started using calc a lot maybe within the last five years or so. And you've been able to use calc within SAS as well. Um, so both SAS and native CSS have the calc functionality. Another thing that's new math-wise in CSS, and I think this is as of earlier this year. Yeah, I wrote new in 2023. Excuse me. You can use uh, trigonometric functions. So you can do sines, cosines, tangents, things like that to kind of do some mathy things with your, um, with your SAS. And again, or with your CSS, sorry. SAS has also had some of these math functions um, already. So if you're already using them in SAS, you can now use them in CSS. I have a couple examples of it because I could not write demos for this. I would just rather show other people's demos because it was hard for me to figure out an actual example of how this should work. So I have this, this CSS tricks article about creating a clock with these new CSS sine and cosine trigonometry um, functions. And the main reason why you'd want to use them here is, let me find it. You can see all of the num numbers are here in a line like this, but they want to have the numbers go all around the circle here, you know, to mimic a clock. And the way to do that is to do some of this math functionality to, to calculate, where is it? Like there, all these are defined with degrees. And then there's some math here that's calculating the radius, like, Radius plus radius times the cosine of the diameter. So it's some mathy stuff that eventually gets it so that the numbers are around a circle like this. So if you want to do stuff with like circles or any kind of physics-y like trigonometry stuff, you can use these uh, CSS functions now as opposed to relying on SAS to be able to do this. So you could do some pretty cool stuff with it. 
I just have not done this cool stuff with it, so I'm glad other people have so I can show it to you. <laughs> right. and then next up is color functions. I was going to talk about just color, but instead I decided to focus on color mix because I feel like that's something that I've really liked in... Um, in, like I used to use it a lot in Compass way back in the day. If anyone remembers Compass, um, they used to have a lot. Compass used to have a lot of really cool like tint and shade functionality to lighten and darken your colors. And SAS actually has a color function as well, or mix function. Sorry, that mixes two colors together to kind of like have them, you know, mix together. Um, a good use case for this is if you want to mix a color with either with a, like a brand color with either black or white, so that you can lighten and darken it at a better rate. Um, one, another thing I don't go into here and I wish I had is using different color spaces like L OKLCH and things like that, which OKLCH does a much better job with um, keeping the color like lightness and um, what's, there's a word for the color balance or whatever kind of similar. I don't go into that here, but I do go into how both SAS's mix and CSS's color mix work so that you can use the color mix instead of the SAS mix. Um, but there's like a couple weird little differences between SAS mix and CSS color mix where the percentage of the mix is reversed between the two methods. Um, like for SAS, if you're mixing 75%, you'll have to mix it at 25% in CSS. Just, I don't know, it's just the way the two specs were, were, were written. And then I, I couldn't find a way to use a CSS custom property, a CSS variable, within these SAS color functions. And it makes sense because um, the, the CSS custom property is like generated on the fly, and, you, and SAS is like, I'm not sure what this is when I'm building this, so I can't, I can't do anything. So here's an error for you. Um, so I can show you how these both work in native CSS and SAS. And again, all these code pens will be linked in the slides. I'm going to try to get the slides up sometime today so that you're able to look, take a look at these yourself, too. So let's see what time it is. Glad there's a clock right over there so I can easily see. Perfect. All right. So here is an example of SAS mix and CSS color mix. You can see that the two are the same. It's like a pink, like a pink border around both with a lighter pink background. And I'm using the mix to, I'm uh, use, taking the pink color border and using the mix to make the background color lighter. And you can see I'm defining, I, I like how I'm pointing to my computer, like you can see I'm pointing there. You, I point up here. I need one of those little clicky remote slide the thingies to do this next time. Um, so you can see I'm defining the CSS custom properties in the root right there, but then I'm duplicating them by just defining the SAS variables in the in the reg in just the regular file. I really wanted to be able to do something like main color equals var main color, just so I'm not duplicating my work. But I get an error. You can see it down here. If I click on it. Um, if you can't read that, it says error color one var main color is not a color because it's having a really hard time determining what the color is through this uh, background mix uh, variable that I or background mix function that I'm using in SAS. So it's like I don't know what this is. So here's an error. Maybe you can figure it out. And yeah, I had to figure it out. So again, it's a bummer that I've had to do that. So I'll co comment it back out, and that works again. I've got some other definitions right down here where I'm defining the color mix. And you can see that the color mix is at 85%, whereas the one that's the CSS mix, which I think is down here, no, nope, it's not down there. The color mix here is 85, and the CSS mix, like which right is some, the right on the bottom, wait for me to read. Right here, the, um, this is the C the SAS mix is at 15%, and the CSS color mix is at 85%. So that's where I've had to kind of do it so that the two colors are the same. Um, I also have some other tests to see, like, oh, maybe it was an issue, maybe the variable issue, if I define them right inside here, maybe that will make the variables work. I think I've got it. 
get rid of this one. Like maybe this will work. Nope, still getting the same error. So there's again, it's an issue with how um, how variables are parsed within how CSS variables are parsed within the SAS vari within the SAS variable scheme. So I'm looking for a better way to do this in case I want to have, I want to define, I would love to just use CSS variables, CSS custom properties wherever and not have to redefine the same colors as SAS variables. So I've got to look into it. Maybe it's something that there's a way we can go ahead and do it at some point, but right now I've had to just double my efforts here and do them the same way. But again, I don't know how realistic this kind of scenario would be in your actual code. This is just me showing you how these two things work. So in all in all, it's great that you're able to actually mix colors through CSS without using SAS. And the next one, which is the most interesting one to me, and this is where I had to actually make some changes in these slides in the last two months. Um, I initially gave this talk in July at Design for Drupal in um, Salem, Massachusetts. And back then, both nest, the native nesting was supported in Safari and Chrome, but not Firefox. But as of, I don't know, like three weeks ago or a month ago, um, Firefox 117 now supports native nesting. So. Now all the browsers support native nesting, but with a caveat, which is, which is also something I've been checking like daily just to see if the spec is gonna change. That's how much these specs are changing is, like earlier this morning, I had to make sure that this, this still worked the same way. Um, there's a difference with the syntax between how you do it in SAS in Chrome and Safari and how you do it in Firefox. Um, and the big, th big difference is now in Chrome and Safari, if you're doing like a, an element selector, so you have like a div or a span or an A, if you have that nested within any other kind of element, you need to put an ampersand before it so that it knows it's a nested native element. I think there's some like browser parsing or browser, browser parsing issues with um, doing that, but this is only in Safari and Chrome that you, can, you have to do this kind of thing, the second, or the second example down there. Firefox figured it out, and you're able to actually nest things without the ampersand in Firefox. And I can show you all three browsers with all of this working. So um, it's, again, pretty nice. So I'll show you Firefox first. So in this example, I have a little thing that says, yay, your browser supports nesting. In July, when I gave this talk, this, would have, this was saying, no, your browser does not support nesting because Firefox did not support nesting at the time. But now it does, and you can see um, I've got five list items right below that, and the fifth one is like a bright magenta color, and the other four are a teal color. And that's because in my code down here, all the way on the bottom, I have a span over here within, within the list item that has the color of fuchsia. So because it's Firefox and it doesn't require that ampersand, you'll see that that last item, because I have a span around that last item, as you can see in the HTML down there on line 10, that one is gonna be fuchsia. But if I minimize this and I open up Chrome, you'll see that it's the same code, but you can also see that this last item, this list item five down here is not fuchsia. And it's because uh, Chrome does not support the ampersand. If I go in here though, and I throw an ampersand in here and save it, let's see if it'll actually, it, it will change it. It'll change to have the fuchsia now because I put that ampersand there. And the same thing happens in Safari. I also have a Safari example too, but you could probably, you know, it's, it'll do the same thing that Chrome does. So that's one little thing you've got to remember if you're going to be using native nesting, unless you use post CSS, which again, I'm going to talk about in a little bit. It's 11.04. All right, so I went through a couple examples of how you can use SAS without using CSS, like that SAS that replicates native CSS functionality. 
What if I want some other SaaS-like functionality on my site, though? And this is where I go into Post CSS. And if you don't know what Post CSS is, it's a Node.js tool that transpiles your CSS using various plugins. And there's so many Post CSS plugins out there of varying quality. Some of them replicate what's coming from the CSS working group. Some of them um, add nice to haves to CSS. And some of them kind of go off the rails and do some random stuff that probably shouldn't be and probably shouldn't be doing in CSS. So like I said, it's a mixed bag. You kind of have to know what you're looking for and what kind of things you want to do. But it could be fun. Some of these like off the rails ones might be fun to play with at home or whatever, mm -hmm. but you probably do not want to use it on your like company's website or something like that or on a client project because that might add some problems. So first, I'm going to go over a couple of post CSS plugins with future CSS syntax. And again, some of this is probably already in all modern browsers, but some of it might be if you want to support some of this stuff in, say, older versions of Firefox or things like that. Uh, the first one is post CSS nesting. And this one is a plugin that supports the nesting specification. Again, this one might be a little different than, um, I think, this one might be out of date because the nesting specification has changed from having the ampersand and having and not having the ampersand. But this will this one will at least make it similar um, so that all the browsers behave the same way. Another one is post CSS custom media, and this one defines custom media using the custom media specification. And I will show you more about that because that's the one that you use to kind of use media. It's Using media query, using custom properties in your media queries is essentially what the custom media specification does. Um, there's post CSS media min max, which adds that range notation. So when you're defining your CSS, um, your media queries, you can write it that way instead. I'm trying to remember if this one is actually supported in all modern browsers now. I think this is one that just maybe got switched over, but I can't remember, so I'd have to double check. And then post CSS preset env is a big list of plugins that are all future CSS syntax post CSS plugins. So if you use those, you know that it's a supported, it's supported CSS from the working group and things like that. So it's not some random, I want to do it this way, so I'm going to write it this way kind of thing. <clears throat> and these ones are kind of post CSS plugins with like nice function, nice to have functionality. These are like your CSS Nano, which minifies your CSS. Um, your pixels to rems, like if you're comfor more comfortable with defining all of your um, CSS values in pixels, excuse me, this one will convert them all to rems, so you don't have to do the math, which I find very convenient. And then the last one is post CSS import, and it transports import, it transforms import rules in a CSS file and by inlining all of your styles. So if you kind of want to mimic that SAS partials um, functionality, you would use something like post CSS import to just like have all your styles in one file. This works a little better if you don't have a ton of CSS on your, on your page. If you want to just include the same CSS on, on all of your pages, like obviously if you're doing a lot with components, you don't want to have every single component CSS on every single page, just on the pages you want. This is more for like general, like site layout stuff that you'd want to put on every single page or your variable like color definitions, things like that. And then the last one is some post CSS plugins that replicate SAS functionality. Again, these ones may or may not be things that are coming from the working group or not. So um, first one is a post CSS mixins. It kind of replicates that mixin um, functionality in SAS. Don't really want to use this one because I don't, I think it's kind of fun. I don't, I don't know, it feels like it's kind of funky. Like it feels kind of weird for me to want to use stuff like this one. The same thing with the one that replicates SAS functions, the defined function. That one might also be kind of weird to use. Um, there's a post CSS map get, which also, which again replicates the map functionality in SAS. And the last one is post CSS nested. As you can see, there's post CSS nested and post CSS nesting, and both of them in the past. Um, supported the two different specs. One of them supported the ampersand and the other, which was the CSS nesting. And nested replicates how SAS always did it without the ampersands. And then there's a list of post CSS plugins from the post CSS website that you'll be able to take a look at um, once I get my slides online. 
<coughs> so this is, again, this one might be a little outdated because of the nesting specification changes, but there were two different nesting plugins for a while because they wanted post-CSS nesting to be, they wanted post-CSS nesting to follow the SAS the specification. Well, post-CSS nested follows the existing SAS specification without the ampersand because that's what people were used to if they were coming from SAS. And then post-CSS nesting follows, has always followed the CSS working group specification. So for a long time, it required that ampersand, but now it doesn't anymore. So now I feel like these two are similar, these two pretty much do the same thing. I just would always want to keep the nesting one because that one's the one that's always going to follow the CSS working group specification, but there are two options and they're very, a lot more similar now than they used to, but they're also, they're also really good to use, especially right now because the specifications in Chrome and Safari and in Firefox are all different. So these ones just kind of, you know, they normalize it so that everything's using the same thing. All right, I can show you some examples of how I'm using PostCSS in my blog and, I, and how PostCSS is being used on Drupal. I just have a couple uh, VS codes that I have open over here. Let's see. This one is my blog. And I use 11D for my blog. I don't use uh, Drupal or anything for it, so the PostCSS is different. And if this, is, if this is too small, I can bump this bad boy up so that it's easier to read. It'd be nice if I got rid of this thing over here too. No, oh, well, I can't. All right, so this is how post CSS is being used on my blog. Um, first of all, I've got, uh, and Lolemondy, if you don't know, is a JavaScript um, static site generator. So it's written all in JavaScript. This is a configuration file for 11D. And this is where I'm putting all of my post CSS plugins and definitions. Obviously I have all of them imported in my, um, in my package.json here. You can see a bunch of them down here. I'm using obviously post CSS, the custom media, um, import, nesting, pixels to rems. Those are a bunch of my favorites. And I have CSS nano somewhere up here too. So. So I'm using a bunch of these to compile all of my SAS and make it, you know, CSSable. And I do not have SAS on my page, by the way. My site does not use SAS. It all uses custom, custom CSS with a couple of these post CSS plugins. So you can see I'm just, you know, importing all of the, all of the, uh, I'm requiring all of the plugins that I want. And then down here. I am running an asynchronous function to ignore the styles.css because that's where I want all of my styles to end up at the end. And then I'm just like ripping through everything, everything else. Firstly, px to rem, um, prop list of the star means that I want everything that's using pixels to be changed to rems. By default, I think it's only the font sizes that get changed over, but if I want to change like my margins and paddings and stuff, I have to put that star in there. And then I do the import, I do the custom media, and I minify everything, and then it returns it all into the style.css. Now I can see in here, I can show you what the custom media de definitions look like. You can see them right there on lines one, two, and three. This is how you use that custom media plugin. I define them all, I just define small, medium, and large. Um, you know, and I'm using the uh, min max, the range notation right there. So I'm saying small is width less, greater than or equal to 30. And then to use them within your code, see if I can find one. Should have had this part queued up, but of course I did not. Uh, not in here, how about in here? I know I've got one somewhere. I know I'm using it, here we go. So in here you can see where I'm doing the definitions, where I'm doing at media small, I want the padding to be this, at media, medium, I want it to be this. That way, if I want to change the, the um, media queries, I can just go into my variables.css and change them there. So that's an example of how it's being used on my site. Now for Drupal, um, here's Drupal. This is Drupal 10, this is a 10.1. And I'm looking at Drupal's package.json right now. And, what, and it's got the same, it's got very, very similar 
um, OCSS imports that my site does. It has import, preset M, it, it's importing all of the preset M um, um, plugins. I think it's to pick or choose. I'm assuming if down the road they're going to narrow this down so they're not importing so much. But they're using px to rem and things like that in there too. And then in Drupal, Drupal 10 uses yarn instead of npm. So you have to run like a yarn build to actually be able to get this to run here. But you can see that it's doing a similar thing that my site is doing, where it's um, running a bunch of the preset M thing, it's running an auto prefixer, it's you know doing the pixels to rem right here, and they're being a little more um, judici judicious with it, where they're saying we want to do everything but these things. So the borders, we don't want it. The box shadows, we don't want it. Outlines, we don't want to use. We want to keep all those as pixels. So, yeah. So there's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff that Drupal is doing to kind of m m modernize their CSS, and a lot of this is part of Drupal 10's uh, CSS modernization initiative. I probably should put a link to that in my slides, and I think I probably will after I get this done. So, because if anyone's interested in helping with helping get Drupal 10 CSS up to to modern it, modernize it, a lot of it is starting to use logical properties. Start, some of it is to like see if there's any other post CSS plugins to use, things like that. But it's a really important initiative just so we're getting rid of a lot of the CSS that we had to write, especially for IE 11, because there's no more IE 11 support in Drupal 10, which, hooray, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so nice. <laughs> so yeah. All right, we have left. Some downsides, post CSS. Um, you might get used, like, this is the reason why I don't like using these, like, off the rails, like, CSS plugins or any, even any of the ones that might not be supported by the CSS working group. You might get used to writing your CSS a certain way, and then if that functionality goes away, you kind of have to figure it out again, and you're not really matched with what the specifications are, so that can be a little frustrating as an engineer, so I like to stick with what's actually going to be coming and not nice-to-haves. Um, if you have too many post CSS plugins, and depending on how you write the code, either your build, your build process might be taking a lot longer, or your performance on the site might be a lot slower, so that's something to look out for. Um, post CSS setup might be confusing depending on um, how well versed in JavaScript you are and how to do JavaScript tooling. Again, I can, I can fumble my way through it, but I'm not an expert by any means, um, and you know, like I said, I use 11E to power my blog, and I'm, a, I'm just able to build, just build in 11D, so I didn't really have to set anything up. But with Drupal, there was a lot of tooling that needed to go in to actually be able to do it. Like again, run it, running, um, running yarn, there's some yarn commands within the um, package.json on, on the Drupal site, so you can actually run it that way, but every single setup will be different, and you have to kind of know how it works. So post CSS can be a little, a little confusing because of that, whereas SAS, I feel like, is a little more straightforward these days. All right, well, this is great. What if I still want to use SAS? What if I don't really want to change everything? Well, you can use them together, and I've kind of gone, gone over this a lot during this, call, during this talk. I don't know why I said during this call. Maybe I'm used to being, online, being on calls all the time still. <laughs> I'm in front of actual people, so. <laughs> So you can use SAS and native CSS together, and I've talked about a couple of, exa of examples on how to do this. Um, most of the time you can use custom properties with SAS variables, but like, when you're putting them into SAS functions, I think that's when you're gonna start running into problems, but for the most part, you can actually like, set your SAS, your SAS variables to be the CSS custom property value, and you won't run into issues if you're just saying color equals you know, SAS variable color, which will compile into that CSS variable. Um, let me see what else do I have in here. And I've got some weird complication stuff with how CodePen defines things in versions of post CSS. Um, but SAS has its own version of calc, which works with which, which works with SAS variables. Um, and I wrote as of Dart SAS, which everyone should be using uh, if you're still using SAS. You don't need to interpolate, interpolate your SAS variables with the, uh, when you're using calc anymore. This is something that's changed. I unfortunately cannot demonstrate that because of the version of SAS that 
CodePen has, which is what I've been using to demo a lot of my stuff. Um, I can show you what interpolation means when I show you the code pen, but um, that's something to look out for if you're still using uh, SAS. You can actually just put, you can actually do your math in a, a calc without having to interpolate the SAS variables. Um, <clears throat> and you can also use calc and SAS to getting, getting around having to use that math.div for um, SAS, like newer versions of Dart SAS. Instead of using the, like, the slash for division, you have to start using math.div. Which has been, which has ground, ground, like grounded many of the, many of gears of uh, <laughs> of uh, front end developers because it's kind of annoying. <laughs> so, but if you use if you use calc and SAS, you don't have to do it. If you do like calc, you know, twelve divided by four, you don't have to do that. So, that's one good thing about that's a good thing about using SAS. And I can show that right here. And I was talking about interpolation, this line 11 right here where I'm doing the calc. You'll see that there's a hash with um, curly brackets with the container width in there. If I was doing that within a newer version of Dart SAS, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to do that. You would just be able to do, come on, there we go. You would just be, you could just do this. Obviously I'm getting an error, or I was getting, yeah. You can see that it's no longer working because um, it doesn't know what this container. It doesn't know what this container with the variable is because it needs to be interpolated with the version of Dart SAS that this this tool CodePen is using. But if you're doing this in your actual site and you have the most up to date um, SAS, then you won't run into that problem. But you can see in here if I do if I just change this to be an actual number like 600 divided by two, um, should work. Maybe, oh, you know what, it's, this also still might be because of code pen issues too. But in other versions of SAS and post CS, other versions of SAS, this should work. I just, for some reason, can't get it to work. But that's all right. Things happen because it's a live demo. All right. So I'm wrapping it up now. Um, should you use SAS in 2023? And of course, I'm going to do the cop-out answer. It depends because <laughs> you might have different like reasons why you want to use it and why you don't. So, yeah, I don't think anyone actually thought I was going to say no. You can't use it ever again. But you know, had to like lead with it. And yeah, here are some reasons to still use SAS in 2023 because there are still reasons. Um, it's not going away anytime soon because it's used all over the place. Just use it as much as you like as long as you're using Dart SAS, of course. Don't use any of the older versions of SAS because they're deprecated and they're not getting any new features. So if you're still using SAS, make sure you're using Dart SAS. Um, maybe you don't feel like native CSS has caught up quite yet to, SAT, to um, SAS, and that's also valid because there are a lot of things like mixins and functions and things like that that a lot of people still find useful in um, SAS, and native CSS does not do that. So if your code base utilizes a lot of stuff like that, you'll want to stay on SAS. Like, why not? You know, you already have your system figured out. So just keep doing it, doing it um, the way you are. And uh, let's see, you still need to support legacy browser versions. Um, you know, like there might be some things that post CSS might not be able to polyfill for you. So again, just use SAS. Why not? Um, if you and again, no more like refactoring your code base. If you, if like just if someone if someone comes in and says, I just want to use CSS. Why not? It's fun. It's new. Like SAS is like, no more SAS. It's old news. Blah blah blah. You can come back and say, well, this is gonna be a huge refactoring job. So you probably we probably don't want to do this. We want to stay with what we have, and maybe we can make some incremental changes to our code base to start using some more custom properties or looking to see what things um, like native CSS does support now that you can maybe rewrite some of your SAS to do. But rewriting your entire code base all at once, probably not a thing you want to do, especially if you have a really big code base. And then my last point is still use SAS when you want to. If you still really like it, still use it. There is nothing wrong with using SAS in 2023 going, or, or, or any time going forward. Yeah, I'm just gonna go over what I talked about. Um, it's a great time to be front-end developer, especially a front of the front-end developer who's really into CSS, as I am. Like, I have been super excited the last few years with all the new stuff that has come into CSS. It is amazing. 
Um, <clears throat> PostCSS can enhance your native CSS um, by adding a lot of functionality that might not be supported by modern browsers. I forgot to update this slide. <laughs> Come on, Firefox support nesting already. It does, so whoops, forgot to delete that. Um, yeah, you can add some useful functionality using PostCSS. You can add functionality that SAS supports today if you want to. Um, you can make you, you can use SAS with modern CSS um, if you want to gradually switch your code base. And you should still use SAS if you want to. <laughs> I've got some other links for further reading. Again, you'll be able to look at these when I get the slides all set up. But it's a bunch of like some of them are spicy takes about like do not drop SAS for CSS, or like, is it time to drop SAS? Like, there's a bunch of, yeah, the spicy takes are really fun to read, and most of the time, the, just the title is spicy, the rest of the article is not as spicy, so, yeah. I'll leave it up for a bit in case people want to take pictures. Um, yeah, let me know. And then I can move on, So I'm pretty much done. I think my other slides are talking about myself again, and then a Q&A, so. Did the picture come out good? You're able to, if, you, if it doesn't look good, you can take another picture, but I wanted to see. All right, again, more about me. You can find me online on Mastodon. You can go to my blog, even though I don't really write about tech. And you can find me on Drupal, Drupal.org, and you can find me on GitHub, which I did not include on here. And yeah, that's it, ta-da. Um. All right, do I have any questions? Yes? So one of the things that I had, I ripped the sass out of my first class, and I was doing the lighting and dark functions that were present with sass. And I ended up with a weird combination of using the HSL color space and some palettes to be able to brighten the dark and using the lightness uh, side of the variable. Am I completely wrong in trying to do that, or is there a better way that I just done that? Uh, the question was at using the old SAS lightness and dark darkness with HSL. Um, that I don't know. I haven't really done a lot with HSL, and I really haven't done a lot with lightness and darkness. I actually was going to talk about lightness and darkness in this talk, but decided to go with um, mix instead. Um, I don't know if, because I know you can use mix with the HSL color space, but I haven't really had any um, experience with it. But I would, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's the way that light and dark is working on the different um, parts of the HSL space that there's some funkiness with it, but yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. That's an interesting one though. I might have to play with that one. Thanks. All right, if there's no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you.